Retina Rounds, episode number 151. Sometimes a 360-degree retinectomy is necessary to address vitreous-based traction, retinal foreshortening, and to successfully reattach the retina. Often a retinectomy is necessary in the setting of advanced proliferative vitreo retinopathy. In today's video presented by Guest Surgeon of the Week, Dr. David Lozano, we'll show you the surgical considerations and steps to perform a 360-degree peripheral retinectomy. We want to thank Dr. Lozano for sharing this case. The patient is a 67-year-old male with a history of right eye ruptured globe secondary to a baseball injury who previously underwent open globe repair and three vitrectomies by an outside provider for recurrent PVR-associated retinal detachment. The patient's vision is hand motions, and you can see on the image here that there is an underfill of silicone oil. There's a funnel retinal detachment that appears narrow proximal to the optic nerve with retinal shortening and folding over the infranasal edge of the optic nerve. There are diffuse PVR membranes that appear both preretinal and subretinal, and chorioretinal scars with surrounding fibrosis at roughly the 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock clock hour positions that may represent prior drainage retinotomy sites. The patient had previously undergone a lensectomy and was left aphakic. Let's see how Dr. Lozano manages this case. Okay, so you can see here that Dr. Lozano is using a 23 gauge uh, vitrectomy setup, and he's gonna start by removing the residual silicone oil in the posterior segment. You'll also notice that there appears to be some areas of iris retraction, and that can be an indication that there is significant anterior PVR and or a residual capsule, uh, which is fused to the posterior surface of the iris, and that will course need to be addressed. Now he's uh, instilling some tissue blue over the posterior pole and that using that stain he's going to be able to better, better visualize these membranes as well as the ILM and now you can see with max grip forceps he's peeling these membranes uh, over the macula in a posterior to anterior fashion. You know the retina is detached here and the lack of counter traction can make peeling uh, these membranes and peeling ILM more challenging but if you start posteriorly closer to, to the optic nerve, the optic nerve um, uh, site can serve as a point of counter-traction to make this a little bit easier. And you can see that there's multiple membranes. It appears that some restaining has been done to better visualize these membranes. And all uh, a lot of care and uh, meticulous peeling is being done here to try to peel as much, as much of these membranes as possible um, towards the, the retinal periphery. And, the reason for this is, uh, is twofold. One is, of course, we want to make sure that all of these membranes are, are removed to uh, better reattach the retina, but it's important to thoroughly peel as much as possible before performing a retinectomy uh, because it's going to be a lot easier. Once the retinectomy is performed, the retina can be even more mobile and peeling these membranes, especially uh, uh, anteriorly, can be uh, more challenging. So now you can see that Dr. Lozano is applying some diathermy. This is going to be the uh, de delineating the edge of the retinectomy. And the purpose of this is uh, the, there are, of course, a number of retinal blood vessels, and those can uh, bleed during uh, creation of the retinectomy. So preemptively, he's going to apply some diathermy to decrease the risk uh, for bleeding. Now, there are different approaches to performing diathermy. You can uh, perform almost like a confluent diathermy, like Dr. Lozano is showing here. Uh, there can be a, lot, a number of small perforating vessels, and so that can really help to minimize the risk for bleeding when the retinectomy is performed uh, and decrease the risk for you know, multiple instrument exchanges to uh, bring the diathermy probe in to, to cauterize any oozing vessels. The other approach would be just to diathermize the major vessels and then um, uh, address any small, uh, small oozers uh, as a retin retinectomy is being created. So now you can see uh, the inferior retinectomy is done, and very important here, he's, um, he's uh, with the assistance of, of, uh, of scleral depression, he's uh, trimming back that, uh, the anterior retina uh, and uh, trying to address as much of the anterior vitreous as possible. You could see those ciliary processes earlier and, and uh, trimming back, uh, cleaning up that anterior vitreous is going to help to decrease the risk for uh, anterior loop PVR, um, ciliary body uh, retraction, and hypotony. So now the retinectomy has been uh, completed now 360 degrees, uh, and you can see also that some perfluorocarbon liquid was used to stabilize the posterior pole before, um, before creating that retinectomy, and that can just help to uh, make sure that the retina is minimally mobile while creating the retinectomy so that it's, a, it's just a much more controlled um, uh, edge uh, to, the, uh, to the retinectomy. So now uh, once the retinectomy is done, perfluorocarbon liquid is used to completely flatten the retina, and now Dr. Lozano is applying some laser. Now, the laser around a retinectomy edge should be about three rows of near-confluent laser. 
Uh, you do have to be careful here, especially with the diathermized edge, uh, that you don't mistake the whitening of the diathermy for whitening of laser. So just make sure that those uh, spots are uh, performed in three rows and uh, to near confluent spots. And now um, uh, an air fluid exchange is performed and silicone oil is being instilled as a tamponade agent. So here's the patient's post-operative fundus and autofluorescence photos. You can see that the retina is reattached under silicone oil, uh, although there appears to be some uh, residual subretinal bands and rotational displacement of the retina. Without this surgery, this patient's eye likely would have become tisical, and remarkably, he was able to achieve 2400 vision with a contact lens. So here are some take-home points. Peripheral retinectomies are sometimes necessary to address tractional forces from PVR. And in patients with intrinsic PVR, that's where the PVR is within the retina, there can be retinal foreshortening. And the only way to reattach the retina in these cases is to perform a retinectomy so that that shortened retina can conform to the posterior surface of the globe. In other cases, the vitreous base may contract, thereby also shortening the retina or potentially contracting and opening new retinal breaks. As we've discussed in prior episodes, the vitreous at the vitreous base is integrated with the underlying retina. And so when there's significant PVR involving the vitreous base, shaving and peeling maneuvers alone may not be sufficient to, uh, to address the underlying traction. And a retinectomy, therefore, must be performed posterior to the vitreous base, and that effectively is going to disinsert the posterior retina from the anterior retina, that anterior retina being integrated with the vitreous. Now one note, uh, while a scleral buckle uh, can be helpful to counteract vitreous base traction, it may be insufficient in some advanced cases of PVR, and therefore a retinectomy may still be required. And last, in some cases, a retinectomy must be performed to access the subretinal space and peel subretinal PVR membranes. Now the extent of the retinectomy does vary. In some cases, just an inferior retinectomy will suffice, since this is where PVR and vitreous base traction are most common. Uh, in this case, due to the presence of significant 360 degrees of anterior traction, a 360-degree retinectomy was necessary. Also, it's likely that since this patient had already been through many prior surgeries, Dr. Lozano wanted to be as aggressive as possible to definitively reattach the retina. Now, just to recap some tips when performing a retinectomy, uh, number one, remember to peel all preretinal PVR membranes thoroughly before creating uh, the, the retinectomy edge. Two, a perfluorocarbon liquid can be very helpful to stabilize the posterior pole when creating a retinectomy. And also the circular edge of the PFCL can help to guide where you will apply diathermy and create uh, the retinectomy. Now bleeding can occur when creating a retinectomy and hemostasis can be achieved again with diathermy and using tamponade pressure. Now one last note, you do want to be careful to avoid iatrogenic trauma to the RPE and choroid when creating a retinectomy. Now in this case, the retina anterior to the desired edge uh, was already uh, detached. Uh, and there was sufficient space for the cutter, but in some cases you may need to aspirate up the anterior edge of the retina to create uh, enough space uh, to introduce the cutter and to create the retinectomy. Overall, yet another tough case nicely managed by Dr. Lozano. We want to thank him again for sharing this case uh, and also for giving us an opportunity to learn more about creating a retinectomy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.